next curve. Hi everyone, this is Leonard Lee, Managing Director of Next Curve, and I'm here at the Intercontinental Hotel here in downtown San Diego with the illustrious Durga Malati, uh, Senior Vice President and General Manager of uh, 5G modems and infrastructure. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. And thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I just did your job for you. So <laughs> now we can leave. I'm just kidding. Well, so you know what? It's wonderful to have an opportunity to talk to you again, uh, especially now that uh, the plenary day is yeah. come to a close, or at least is coming to a close. And how do you feel? I think, uh, first of all, it was good to see everyone in person. Uh, yes. It's been, uh, what, about two years or so, maybe a little more Too than long. that. Yeah. Uh, and it's always nice to, we've had virtual events, yep. but uh, seeing everyone in person always brings out something new, panel discussions, actual talks, uh, talking to people offline, off the record. It's been just great. Uh, great first day so far. Yeah. And you know what? I, I had a great time. Um, very insightful. Um, and interesting plenary sessions. And so, um, you know what? What I wanted to start off our, our discussion um, off on was this question of um, what is the state of 5G in your mind? Because, you know, you mentioned, well, 5G has been in play for, you know, uh, three to four years now, right? right? And there's been deployments, there, there's a lot of things that have been happening, but now, this year, where are we? What is that, that state of the nation? So, uh, actually, we are just about entering the fourth year uh, mm. of 5G. 5G initial launches in the first quarter of 2019, give or take. Mm. So, uh, to be honest, I mean, if you take, take a step back and think about all the things that we've done in 5G over the last three years, it's quite amazing, actually. Mm. If you think about, uh, you know, back in 2019, uh, the original launches, which mm. were in um, six different regions in mm. uh, US, Korea, Europe, Australia, Japan, and China. Uh, now we have significantly larger number of regions that have 5G uh, uh, deployments out there, commercial deployments. And uh, in the last three years, we've gone from a gradual transition from uh, non-standalone mode, wherein you rely upon both 4G and 5G, towards standalone mode. Uh, that transition started off in China, it's occurring in the US as we speak, we see lots of it coming up in Europe as well, right. and which, which is a big upgrade from a network perspective uh, right. on uh, a new core network, new procedures, a lot of new capabilities mm -hmm. that come into the network as well. So, uh, setting the stage mm -hmm. for the new uh, applications that we expect will start coming out from, from native 5G by itself. Uh, and finally, uh, when we take a look at the uh, features themselves, mm -hmm. uh, we now see a combination of aggregation of spectrum mm -hmm. uh, within sub-6 spectrum itself, aggregating FTD and TDD bands mm -hmm. and carrier aggregation, uh, and uh, aggregating spectrum between sub-6 and millimeter wave, right. which is you know, in planning and it's coming up, devices right. are re announced support for that. Mm -hmm. So we've come a long way from a world which was in 2019 was either a sub-6 NSA mode 5G or a right. millimeter wave NSA mode 5G and today mm -hmm. it's kind of all of the above, a combination right. of right. sub-6 and millimeter wave. Mm -hmm. Those who started with sub-6 deployments are incorporating millimeter wave into their mm -hmm. networks. In the US mm -hmm. it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the operators who started with millimeter wave are now bringing in sub six into the spectrum. So it's kind of nice to see that we are really uh, stretching our feet in terms of using all the uh, available spectrum and upgrading the network to a standalone mode. Right. And from our standpoint, as we uh, have been driving 5G technology into, into the overall ecosystem from a device standpoint, from our small cells, and as we enter into, and I'll talk a little bit about infrastructure as well, uh, Things have gone according to plan, mm -hmm. which is this is what we expected 5G rollout to happen. Right. Uh, and in three years, we've accomplished quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final point I wanted to make is that uh, the device, um, if you think about the kinds of devices that are there today, when you think of mm -hmm. a 5G device today, we've gone way beyond smartphones. Right. We see a lot of CPEs. Mm -hmm. uh, driving fixed wireless access applications. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we see 5G-based uh, uh, connected laptops mm -hmm. and tablets. Uh, we see 5G-based cameras, routers, right. right. AGVs. 
uh, uh, everyone is looking at uh, bringing in 5G connectivity into all kinds of other devices, very diverse set of devices, which we believe is going to be the true expansion of 5G beyond smartphones. So a mm. lot of things that we like where we are right now, but it's also a platform for uh, you know, a lot of the innovative use cases that we expect mm. will start being built on top of 5G connectivity. Right. So I have a question for you um, regarding uh, 5G as a access uh, access technology. Um, you know, and this is not an either or question. This is more of okay, given all the options that are that there are out there, you know, including Wi-Fi, of course. Uh, you know, how is 5G differentiating itself? I mean, what's that key message there, right? Because there's there's these debates about, well, you know, uh, 5G is going to take over the world, or, or Wi-Fi is going to take over the world. You know, there's these sort of artificial wars that are happening, uh, tech wars that are happening, right? And uh, but I mean, what would you tell my audience here? The next curve audience differentiates 5G, and how? how enterprises in particular need to think about 5G. Sure. So, uh, you know, even three, four years back when there was this original debate about comparisons of 5G and 4G, as mm -hmm. you know, we spent a lot of time uh, analyzing and predicting uh, what's the improvement in capacity mm -hmm. and average data rates mm -hmm. that a user can expect right. from a 5G connectivity compared to 4G. A lot of it had to do with the fact there's plenty of bandwidth in 5G compared to 4G. So that right. by itself actually brings in a different kind of a user experience. Right. And then when you start thinking of some of the um, you know attributes of millimeter wave where mm -hmm. you bring in new spatial techniques and increases the overall network capacity significantly more than what we had seen in 4G right. before. So I think in, the, in that sense, the comparison between 5G and 4G I think it's well understood at this point in time what 5G brings to the table relative to 4G when it comes to mobile broadband and latency and reliability. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, 5G connectivity and uh, uh, you know the comparisons that sometimes people do against Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. especially in an enterprise environment. Right. We from Qualcomm don't see it quite that way. We believe that they actually complement each other, right. uh, but they stand out in their own uh, their own ways. So. Let me give you two examples of that. One of the things that we have seen, mm. and even today, uh, some of the uh, speakers at 5G Summit actually mm. talked about it. Uh, one of the things that they look for in these uh, private networks, 5G private networks, is the predictability and the reliability uh, of the network. Mm. Like the killer app, if you will, is I want to have an operational, I'm running all of my operations. This is not the IT systems running on it, right. but my entire operation is based upon something that is predictable and always works. Right. I don't need to think too much more about it. Mm -hmm. And there are things that cellular connectivity make it easier to do it that way. Mm -hmm. It works and it's predictable. You can guarantee a certain quality of service with mm -hmm. that. That is clearly something that people do look for in right. 5G. You can do that with Wi-Fi mm. in specific applications, but in some other applications, especially when you have an extreme amount of mobility going on, right. extremely large warehouses or, mm. or factory floors where you have high speed moving mm. conveyor belts or, or AGVs, there are things with mobility that cellular does actually start shining. Mm -hmm. And so that's a place where 5G connectivity easily says, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it's the only thing. You can always complement it with Wi-Fi, but right. they kind of go in that way. The other part is uh, on a, you know, we talked about quality of service, but there's mm -hmm. a little bit more in 5G uh, mm -hmm. compared to what we had done in previous generations. And that's called network slicing. Mm -hmm. The ability to differentiate your service at an application level, mm -hmm. at an application level as opposed to, uh, you know, at some much higher level. So, for example, We've had quality of service, QoS and uh, cellular systems for a while now, mm. uh, in, uh, from 3G days where we had voice and everything else which is not voice. Right. And in 4G, there was a little bit more than that, voice and video and maybe a little bit more on top of that. But in 5G with network slicing, you have the ability to say within the video, 
well, what application are you talking of? And maybe I can differentiate between a video that's probably going on Teams or Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so that's like work related video. So maybe I want to differentiate that mm -hmm. uh, compared to a YouTube video, which might mm -hmm. be just a consumer application that right. you're running versus a Netflix video, which mm -hmm. is a different attribute altogether. Right. So network slicing allows you to differentiate the same at, at, at an application level, mm -hmm. you can differentiate between that while everything looks the same at some different level. Like it's all video, but it's all different kinds of video mm -hmm. in itself. Picture the same thing in a factory setting in an industrial environment mm -hmm. where with 5G and using network slicing, when you're running your operations there, you can differentiate between different applications. Mm -hmm. Maybe for that conveyor belt and maybe for that AGV, these are like far more precise uh, uh, you know operations right. and so you want to give it a certain kind of a quality of service right. compared to uh, an IP camera that might right. be out there which you give a different kind of a quality of service. Right. So these are again places where 5G brings in some unique attributes. Right. On the other hand uh, uh, you know you could come out with other applications where no you don't necessarily need 5G you can just right. go with Wi-Fi and that one. So right. our view has been they complement each other right. there are places where 5G private networks right. really shines through. Right. You can always complement that with Wi-Fi as right. well. Well, thank you for that. That was okay. a very comprehensive answer. And so okay. I'm, we're going to move on to the next question here, yeah. which is, you know, Qualcomm has been sort of this this uh, catalytic force, right, the moving these Gs from generation to generation, right? And you guys have played a very important role in, in that regard. And so one of the things that I know that you guys like to talk a lot about is ecosystem. <laughs> ecosystem and um, so given where we are with 5g today I mean you met, mentioned you know where we are with the standalone just transition from non standalone right. to standalone uh, you know this maybe reframing or rethinking about uh, millimeter wave given some of the new features that are, are, are coming um, uh, what are some of your recommendations to the ecosystem in order to accelerate and uh, continue to push the progression of 5G, and uh, you know whether it's from a deployment perspective, it's from a, you know a, a end user adoption perspective, or it's from IoT device proliferation and you know data gathering perspective. Right. Okay, so that's a pretty, uh, you know, I can go even more comprehensive on Oh, on really? <laughs> but okay. maybe uh, for the sake of uh, brevity, I'm going to actually yeah. focus on, uh, you know, there are multiple players in the ecosystem mm -hmm. in general. Uh, you can start with app developers, mm -hmm. you can go into OEMs, yeah. uh, mobile operators, right. and maybe I'll touch upon these three just as an example sure. of that. So let's start with app developers. Uh, the goal of cellular technology is not to prescribe every single application that's running on top of it. Mm -hmm. When we drove 4G into the market, mm -hmm. we didn't necessarily say, by the way, you should run these following applications on top of it. In fact, the general philosophy behind cellular uh, technology and uh, uh, the way standardization works and research works is you build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. You can't always predict exactly what application is right. out there. But it is indeed a platform for innovation because there's so many capabilities mm -hmm. in that. You know, I really look forward to the new applications that can be built on top of it. Mm -hmm. If you want me to predict every single one of them, no, it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we truly trust a lot of the app developers and their innovation in terms of utilizing that capability and building on top of it. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation to the app developers would be to get involved and you'll actually see a lot more or a lot of the capabilities that are there in 5G as a technology and I'm sure there'll be lots of applications that will come up on top of it. We are already seeing you know, things that we didn't quite anticipate but they are coming up yeah. already. So that's one of the things. Okay. The second one is OEMs. Historically, we've had, you know, uh, smartphones, laptops, um, even fixed wireless access, mm -hmm. routers, mobile hotspots. Right. These are devices, they didn't exist, if you kind of think about it, we didn't have all of these in the 2G days. Mm -hmm. Gradually, with right. every G, there's a new device category that comes in. Right. 4G was the beginning of the smartphone era. The right. whole notion of a smartphone came in there, and by the way, the app ecosystem also started coming in with 4G. So as we go towards 5G, 
with 5G uh, as a technology that can be used in uh, all kinds of networks beyond smart and, and the use cases therefore start going into new kinds of devices that don't exist today we've barely scratched the surface of AR and VR devices mm -hmm. uh, we're just getting there we just got right. started with that we're not there yet right what you would want ultimately is uh, you know a 5G connected AR or an XR device uh, and doing things that you probably can't think of right now. So that right. means that anyone who's in the business of building AR devices should start thinking mm -hmm. of, okay, what should that device look like? And right. that's just one example, by the yeah. way. There's already a few of them that use Wi-Fi today, but that's just one example. There could be uh, uh, precision manufacturing uh, equipment makers mm -hmm. uh, who can now, instead of relying upon wireline industrial ethernet, think of native 5G connectivity in them and what does that mean in terms of commissioning that that piece of equipment and mm -hmm. you know the downtime and uptime of, of that how do you bring it up very quickly mm -hmm. these are OEMs I mean much right. larger equipment but certainly OEMs that are there right. and we've talked a lot about auto OEMs who are now right. going one step further beyond just telematics right. using 5G technology not just for telematics, telematics connected to the network but using vehicular communications right. V2X and so on so there's a lot of new kinds of capabilities that are there in 5G and, and different, a very diverse set of OEMs should start paying attention. Mobile operators as the third, uh, 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 you know, we're not, we talk to them all the time, we work very closely with them and uh, I'm very, you know, happy and to see that a large number of mobile operators are thinking outside the box of how do I utilize these different uh, pieces of spectrum that mm -hmm. uh, they use today. So. The, the more traditional way of doing that is you have a combination of FTD spectrum and mid band and high band and one is for coverage, one is for capacity and the other one is for a blend of both. But what if uh, there was the ability to start thinking of, well, you know what, by the time you get to millimeter wave, there's plenty of spectrum. There's like, you know, gigahertz of spectrum sometimes uh, that's available to a single operator. So what if you think slightly differently about it? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the announcements that we made first in Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and today we showed a demo, was with standalone millimeter wave, mm -hmm. standalone millimeter wave, uh, which gives new capabilities into that spectrum and saying, mm -hmm. okay, maybe you want to use that specifically for uh, 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 a set of applications that could be for fixed wireless access alone, I'm going to use millimeter wave. I'm mm -hmm. not going to be using sub six at all. That's like one option. I'm not saying that's right, the way right, to do right. it. But it's another way of slicing and dicing the uh, different pieces of spectrum and saying maybe I want to use this right. for these applications and uh, the other pieces of spectrum for this application and in some instances aggregate all of them together. Mm -hmm. So this is innovative ways of use, utilizing the spectrum that you have either been allocated or that you actually uh, bid for and thinking about it differently for different use cases mm -hmm. and you know there's so many things as a mobile operator you have both public and private networks that are emerging especially in the private networks domain. So thinking differently in that domain would be, and we are seeing a lot of that already, so I'm stating the obvious, but I'm really looking forward yeah, to that. You know what, it's interesting that you, you've you brought up thinking differently several times, meaning you know mindset shift, right? Thinking about the network, the technologies, maybe applications. Right. And, and getting out of, let's say, the, the old mold of, uh, you know, um, thinking about wireless, you know, and uh, and I, I think, you know, my impression is that that is probably one of the things that needs to be constantly nurtured is this ongoing, you know, mindset shift given 5G has so many features, like you were saying, some really unusual features, quite honestly, right, uh, that are becoming, especially with uh, uh, 5G advanced, right, right. That, that, you know, and I, I spoke to John Smee about this, it, it Maybe folks need to really start thinking differently about wireless infrastructure, wireless connectivity, you know, especially as it pertains to 5G. So, and you know, one great example is like RedCap. You know, I, I, there's been several folks that are in the industrial side of, you know, uh, in enterprise that have brought up RedCap several times and how they're really looking forward to it. And, and I know that you guys have already presented how this could create a whole new category of devices for industrial, right? I mean, it's really exciting. I don't, I don't know why, but uh, these folks who are looking at 
modernizing and making and you know building out these intelligent factories are really excited about yes, it. Yes, they are. Right. So, and as a part of that, I mean, just uh, uh, wanted to mention one other thing that's related to all of this is evolution. Uh, of 5G technology is something that's not just in devices, but there's also we, a lot of speakers today and the 5G yeah. summit spoke about it uh, in the context of uh, network evolution and network yeah. upgrade and right. utilizing a lot of the emerging concepts from uh, RAN virtualization mm -hmm. and usage of open interfaces with ORAN, right. which allows the network to really scale up and down from a nationwide network all the way down to a manufacturing right. plant. Uh, and uh, the ability to, uh, you know, bring in features at a much faster cadence in some of these yeah. networks compared to what you see in, in public networks. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. I mean, yeah. uh, and that's how, as Qualcomm, we've been working with the entire ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to be talking to John Smee about uh, a funky feature. So that'll be an exciting <laughs> episode for you guys to tune into. And speaking of tuning into, Yesterday, you told me to tune in to today. That's right. right. So, <laughs> what are what are the big nuggets that those shiny nuggets that you got you really excited? Well, like, there were quite a few moments, so I'll try to see if I can, uh, you know, uh, throw some spotlight on on some okay. of the key ones. So, one is uh, while we made an announcement on standalone millimeter wave mm -hmm. in Mobile Congress uh, earlier this year. Uh, there was a demo that was shown, which, yeah. which showed the entire uh, modem RF bring up and close to about 8 plus gigabits per second. Mm -hmm. This is standalone millimeter wave. We are very happy with that and a lot of our customers are looking forward to that uh, in their networks. Uh, another uh, announcement that we made was uh, with Vietel, mm -hmm. who is uh, right. uh, going to be adopting our uh, VDU, uh, which is uh, uh, an ORAN compliant baseband processing platform mm -hmm. along with our RU solutions for their network so really looking forward to that uh, and we doubled down a little bit further on showing some data of how blending in AI algorithms into our 5G modem is really enhancing yeah. some of the 5G capabilities of course we've always been moving the needle on right. 5G capabilities but when we brought in AI now I would argue from now onwards it is something that one should be expecting moving forward and this right. is something that you know we'll continuously do so that's another theme and uh, in some of the speakers who talked about it speak you know, they they specifically mentioned uh, the transition from uh, the network transition from the traditional RAN based the traditional RAN solutions to more of a RAN, virtualized RAN solutions mm -hmm. plus ORAN solutions so mm -hmm. that is something it's probably not news per se but the yeah. fact that so many people so talked about it uh, right. uh, openly is something that uh, I wanted to and I didn't want to take away uh, any of the spotlight from them yesterday so I said stay okay. tuned so these are some of the things that you saw there's plenty more coming up uh, uh, there's uh, master classes tomorrow in which there'll be a little more of a deep dive into all the things that I spoke about so uh, looking forward to tomorrow day two so you are you telling me that there's even more to tune into there's certainly a lot of uh, content uh, that's coming in tomorrow uh, lots of opportunities to get like a deeper cut into everything that we talked about today okay well wonderful well there you have it from Durga Maladi Senior Vice President and General Manager of 5G Modems and Infrastructure. From, brought to you by NextCurve. Uh, so remember, follow us at www.next-curve.com. Uh, and I want to thank you, Durga, so much for the uh, opportunity to chat with you after day one. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, the whole uh, summit concludes and and concludes in uh, grand fashion and to your satisfaction yep. so um, you know but uh, I'll tell you I'm really enjoying the conference and it's been uh, uh, really um, an enlightening um, uh, event to attend so thank you so much glad to have you here. thank you visit us at www.next-curb.com